Sarah here from BJC Health and thanks for tuning in to another one of our online educational workshops. So this upcoming event is presented by two of our rheumatologists and it's all about why the correct diagnosis and treating rheumatoid arthritis as early as possible is so crucial. So um, this is part one of the event. If you'd like to continue watching after this recording's finished, please consider signing up for BJC Connect where you can access all of our online events as well as a number of different recordings and resources that you might find helpful. But um, enjoy the event and hopefully see you again soon. Looking forward to tonight's event, we've got two, I guess, yeah, oh, all of our speakers are exceptional, but I guess these two are a couple of my favourites. Um, so we've got Dr. Andrew Jordan. So give everyone a wave, Andrew. Hi, here he is. <laughs> yeah, so some of his fans might be here tonight, but Andrew's done a couple of these events, but it's his first one about rheumatoid arthritis. So um, he's looking forward to tonight. And then we've also got Dr. Pauline Habib. She's in the pink. She will give you a wave. Um, and so I guess one thing about Pauline, some of you might remember from the last event Pauline did, she has a very anxious puppy. So if you hear some scratching and some interesting noises, it might be Pauline's puppy. But I thought if we told you that now, then you would uh, forgive her if she looks a little stressed at some point. Um, but both of them are really looking forward to tonight's event. It's all about rheumatoid arthritis and I guess diagnosis and why it's so important to do that as early as possible. So if it's your first event, a big welcome to you. Um, we, you'll notice that when you come in, you're, you're placed on mute and that's just so everyone has got the best chance of hearing our speakers as they get talking. We would love to hear from you though. So if you have questions along the way tonight, uh, which you probably will, uh, we'd really like you to use the chat. And I guess Andrew and Pauline, at this stage, we'll probably go through their entire presentation first, and then we'll go through all the questions at the end. And then I'll be manning the chat. If there's anything I can answer, I'll do my best to do that along the way. Um, but otherwise, yeah, enjoy the presentation. I guess over to you, Andrew. Andrew will be uh, kicking us off. All right. I'm just going to share my screen. Is that look all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, all excellent. Good. So yeah, it's a quite a long title. I hope um, I, I'm sure some of you have on this call have uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and for those who don't, maybe you have got a family member or you're just interested, and uh, hopefully you all learn something along the way and understand a little bit about how rheumatologists think about this problem and how we uh, try to communicate this to you. So we're talking about um, if I can move my slides. There we are. Uh, Firstly, what is rheumatoid arthritis? How it's diagnosed? Uh, when might we start treatment for rheumatoid and when might we, why might we not? Uh, how we may assess your responding to treatment? And then finally, we move on to the aims of treatment and uh, exactly how we might treat it. So it's meant to be very general. Um, of course, we're not gonna talk about any specific scenarios with um, individual people, but uh, more just as an educational overview. So this is one of the classic sort of uh, pictures that uh, rheumatologists uh, get presented about rheumatoid arthritis and thinking about the joint. And so on the left, you've got a normal joint and on the right, you've got a rheumatoid arthritis joint. And uh, what you see here is two bones and cartilage here and a, a um, lining of the joint. Uh, this, is, this is normal. What happens with rheumatoid is this joint lining uh, gets attacked by the immune system. So the immune system is overactive and attacks the joint. And all these cells, these immune cells go in and uh, inflame the joint. And that's why you get swelling and pain and stiffness. And uh, this is what you'll visibly see. You'll visibly see the swelling on your joint because of this thickened uh, tissue. But then what happens over time, which is the second key point about rheumatoid arthritis, is that it starts to uh, nibble away at the bone. And so you lose this nice lining, you lose your cartilage, and you nibble away at the bone. And in the long term, that is what causes a lot of the problems with deformity. And the essence of what we're talking about today is that we get in, we treat uh, these inflammation cells, so we stop this joint getting damaged. Because once there's damage in the joint, that's irreversible. So we aim to get in there and treat uh, and get rid of all these immune cells and tissue. So 
rheumatoid involves uh, joint uh, symptoms, as I said, pain, swelling, stiffness, uh, difficulty moving the joint. Often it'll be worse in the morning where you uh, find it hard to move and get going, which may improve after a few hours. But also there's more generalized symptoms where you might feel generally unwell, often feel very fatigued, sometimes have temperature dysregulation in more uh, extreme situations, you might have weight loss. And of course, all of these problems, uh, when they're chronic, lead to uh, low mood, depression, and clearly frustration if uh, you're not able to do the things uh, you'd like to do. So this has sort of led some people to say, should it be called rheumatoid arthritis or rheumatoid disease? Because clearly it's not just joint problems that uh, affect people. That's just one part of it. And so as you can see, these are some of the things that can be affected with rheumatoid arthritis. There's fatigue, um, uh, malaise, dry eyes and dry mouth, a feeling like you've got the flu. And in more advanced and severe problems, you can get lung involvement, uh, eye involvement, and inflammation of blood vessels, which we don't see much these days because we treat it much better. And in the long term, if you don't get control of the inflammation, uh, you end up with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, a higher risk of skin cancers and lymphomas. And so a lot of the treatment these days, we know reduces those risks. So all these things on the right side, we see much, much less of these days because we treat it very differently. So how is rheumatoid arthritis diagnosed? I might bring Pauline in here and... Uh, how, how do you diagnose it when you see someone falling? I'm just listening to something. So um, generally when people come to the rooms, they, they usually have joint pains of some sort. And, and so then the question is, what's the quality of, those, of that pain? Um, generally with rheumatoid arthritis, it's an inflammatory condition. So people have inflammatory joint symptoms. So that's where you get pain and stiffness. And it's generally worse when people are not moving, so with inactivity. Um, and often I ask um, someone, is the pain worse in the morning or if you've been sitting or lying for long periods of time and, and do you feel stiff? And by stiffness, I mean, do you feel like you're stuck in gel and it takes you a while to loosen up in the morning? Um, and generally that's what people experience and the stiffness takes about half an hour or longer to, to um, improve. But as they get moving, it feels better. Um, usually people can tell, for example, if a large joint, so, you know, like a knee or an ankle is swollen, but sometimes it's a bit harder with the smaller joints in the hands. Um, uh, so we don't necessarily rely so much on the swelling bit, um, but it's mainly the quality of the pain. Um, and if they have other symptoms as well, I think you touched on it on your previous slides with, you know, fatigue. And if there's other symptoms to suggest, um, you know, chronic overall inflammation um, that's going on in their body um, that's coming from their joint. And the pattern of the joints is also really important. Um, so that helps us distinguish between um, things like rheumatoid from psoriatic arthritis, for example, or other types of immune driven inflammatory joint diseases. Um, and then in, on examination, I usually look for things like tenderness in the, in the joints when I'm, um, pressing on their joints or palpating them, um, if they have any irritability of their joints as well. Um, so often um, people will experience that I kind of give their wrist a bit of a wiggle or, for, or whatnot, um, or their hips and, and so forth. And that's just to see if there's potentially some irritability because of underlying inflammation. Um, and, and then of course, if there's any gross swelling that we can see um, and that's, that's essentially what I'm mainly looking for on examination, but I always examine someone in their entirety. So I examine all of the joints, even if they've come, for example, with just knee pain and, and stiffness, for example. Um, and, um, usually I'll have a, you know, I'll examine their chest, for example, if they've got symptoms to suggest lung involvement or heart involvement. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much what, you know, I do initially, um, before I start ordering investigations. And, and generally the investigations that we order are to work out, well, does somebody actually have evidence of inflammation? So their um, markers of inflammation, which are the CRP and ESR, are they elevated? Sometimes they can be normal and, they clear, and someone clearly has inflammation, but usually they're elevated. And then are there any other symptoms, signs, sorry, to suggest that there is inflammation? So their hemoglobin, 
aspects of their um, full blood count might be um, off. Um, they might have problems with their liver or their kidneys because of inflammation. So I check all of those things. Um, usually when somebody has clearly inflammatory symptoms and, I, and there's, there's you know, good evidence for um, inflammation when I'm examining them as well, I might order also an, an, a rheumatoid factor and um, an anti-CCP anti -CCP antibody, which are the antibodies that we see in people with rheumatoid arthritis. But I always tell patients they're not diagnostic tests. They're more prognostic, which means that even if you have rheumatoid arthritis, for example, they can those antibodies can be negative in you know up to 50% of people. So just because they're negative, it doesn't mean that you don't have rheumatoid arthritis if the clinical situation otherwise fits. Um, and depending on um, whether there's any anything I can find on examination with their joints, it might be, for example, um, an ultrasound that I do of their joints because I can try to take fluid from that or the radiologist can um, to make sure there's nothing else that's also potentially causing inflammation. Um, sometimes if there's no inflammation, uh, sorry, there's no swelling to um, take fluid from the joint, I might do an MRI because that gives us better information about inflammation of the lining of the joint. If there's any evidence of erosions, which you touched on before, which is a complication of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and if there's any inflammation even around tendon sheaths, which can sometimes be a bit of a clue in the right situation that there's um, an inflammatory problem going on. Um, so that's, yeah, that's generally my approach. Um, yeah. X-rays are, I, I generally use X-rays for um, people that come in, for example, with long-standing history of inflammatory disease. And then I want to look at whether there's any evidence of chronic damage. So um, you can sometimes see erosions if symptoms have been present for a very long time. But if someone's come in and they've only had symptoms, say, for example, for two, three months or six months, it's unlikely that the x-ray is actually going to be very helpful in, in showing any, um, any structural damage. It might show a bit of osteoarthritis in some people, but that's, um, that's not the same yet. Yeah. So, I mean, in essence, uh, the, the, the symptoms and the clinical examination are the most important part. So yeah. you can still have rheumatoid with normal blood tests, normal x-rays, normal scans, um, and that's something we get asked a lot, you know, but my blood tests are negative. It doesn't mean you don't have rheumatoid. It's, it's based exactly. on, on those other things. So this is one of those textbook pictures about rheumatoid. Um, so in an early rheumatoid, by early, we're talking about years between this. This is not days. This is not weeks. This is not months. This is years. This is what happens if we don't treat rheumatoid, okay? I, I want to very stress very much, this is, this is not the usual pattern of what we see. So uh, early on, this might be uh, someone's hand. You can see swelling in the joint here, um, in, in these ones here. Um, often these ones uh, can be involved and there might be difficulty making a fist. But over time, what happens is those joints can get damaged if you don't treat. And then you start to see uh, deformities here and ultimately that's clearly an abnormal hand which the the um, uh, might have difficulty using so this used to happen 40 years ago this used to be almost an inevitable um, pro um, progression but it it doesn't happen these days in that almost all cases because we get on and treat it early um, and so uh, is this inevitable Absolutely not. And that's what the picture you might see, you type Google, Google it and say uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you see a picture like this, this is not what should happen to you. Uh, and um, we've got many um, ways of treating rheumatoid these days to prevent that. And as long as we get in there early and treat it, it shouldn't happen. So again, what you can see uh, on the top here, uh, this is a normal looking joint here. In an intermediate one like above, you start to see the, the bone getting nibbled away here. And this is where the bone is. That, that's, that's the erosion that Pauline was talking about. So the bone's getting nibbled away by that uh, uh, overactive um, joint lining. So what, what you see uh, over, this is over years, uh, symptoms, which is the, the green line, uh, that's the inflammation. It waxes and wanes. People clearly report they have good times, they have bad times. Uh, sometimes there's a trigger, sometimes there's not a trigger. 
but it'll wax and wane over time. And in, in actual fact, you can see symptoms often decline over time, almost because people get used to it, um, we think. But what happens if you don't treat it is you, this yellow line shows the disability increases. So even though the symptoms go down, the functional impairment and disability goes up. And that pretty much correlates with what we see on x-rays. So you get more damage on x-rays, more disability. So that's why you might hear some rheumatologists talking about, oh, we want to prevent damage to your joints because we're thinking what we don't want you to be getting problems 10, 15 years down the track. Um, of course, we want to treat your symptoms, uh, but there's the, the two factors that we have to treat. So um, this brings up the sort of concept of what some you might hear about of a window of opportunity, where we know uh, if we get in early and treat, um, you prevent that damage from happening, and then you don't end up with this inevitable progression. You don't end up with those late stage deformities. You don't end up with that functional decline. And I tell people, you know, you, you don't usually know when someone's got rheumatoid uh, that's well treated. Their joints look normal. You know, you might sit next to them at work and not even know. Uh, and that's what we in this day and age find with rheumatoid arthritis when you treat it earlier. And uh, we know that most of that damage that happens is most rapid in the first two years. And 75% uh, of all that damage happens in the first five years. So um, Pauline, what would you regard as the window of opportunity when you'd like to start treatment? How soon is soon? So soon. No, um, I'd be aiming for, you know, within, I guess within six months. I mean, often people don't have, have had symptoms for a very long time. And, and you know, a lot of people will um, just kind of push through because, you know, you've got to carry on with life. You've got a family to look after, you're trying to work, et cetera. So often, you know, things get delayed. But as soon as I start to, as soon as I see someone and I diagnose them, I want it, I want them to start on treatment because it's super important. But if somebody's come to me with um, rheumatoid arthritis symptoms and we've diagnosed it and it's within six months, I'm like, sweet, that's great. Let's get onto this. Let's crack on. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and so this is from uh, in Australia. This is again, going back in time before our good treatments, but you can see within five years, of uh, not treating rheumatoid very well, half, oops, half hadn't uh, had stopped working with a mean time of seven years. So this happens fairly early on. So this is why we start talking about treatment pretty much at the first visit that we see uh, someone with rheumatoid arthritis. So, oops. So, uh, Paul, um, who needs medication for rheumatoid and, and who might not need medication for rheumatoid? So, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think if you've got symptoms, if someone has symptoms and has inflammation, uh, you know, active inflammation, um, then they certainly need medications because the aim, again, is to control that inflammation, get rid of it if possible. Um, and as we said, the sooner that they start this, the better it is. Um, if, if you have... Um, if, for example, you've got some symptoms that don't sound particularly inflammatory, um, you know, there's no evidence of inflammation, you know, as I say, objectively, so on MRI scans or, or and so forth, particularly um, in that situation, but someone has, for example, positive antibodies, um, then I wouldn't necessarily commence treatment. I, I think that in that context, what, what that means is overall someone is at increased risk of developing uh, rheumatoid arthritis, but they don't actually have it yet. So we need to watch out for the development of those symptoms. Sometimes it can actually mean, those positive antibodies can actually mean that they're at really, really early stages of the condition when which they're not presenting in a typical fashion or, or not quite presenting with rheumatoid as yet. And again, there's not really you know, much evidence to say that you should treat as a preventative thing. So if you don't really have rheumatoid, um, then we're not gonna start treatment. I wouldn't suggest that because the, the risks of possible side effects outweigh any potential benefit. But if you certainly do have symptoms and there's active inflammation, then that balance is shifted essentially. There's more benefit than risks. Yeah. I mean, essentially the vast majority of people that see us have pain and swelling and stiffness. So they've already got symptoms. So by definition, those people need medication. Um, so this is, and, and that's not saying that you can't 
involve other aspects. We'll talk about that other aspects of how to manage it, but they often will still need medication. So there's a very small minority, I would, I would say, who doesn't need medication. Um, and, uh, uh, but they, most people do. And that's because we know that the people who do so well with rheumatoid, we treat early. And so, yeah, coming back to the window of opportunity, how soon should medication commence? It, it basically, we aim to start it in the window of opportunity. So within that first six months, if someone, as soon as someone's diagnosed with rheumatoid, I'm discussing treatment, talking about options, uh, working out a plan to how to get people uh, feeling better. Um, so that's right at the very beginning, which can be very confronting, of course, but uh, for all those factors, uh, you know, if you had a heart attack, you wouldn't want to sit around and talk about it for too long. You want to get on top of it straight away. So that's kind of how we think in some ways, obviously not the same urgency as a, as a heart attack, but we, we, we do uh, like to get on top of it soon. So this is a very busy slide. Uh, I might do this one at a time, uh, Pauline. So how, when someone sees you, you've got them on treatment, uh, you're treating someone for rheumatoid. How do you work out if they're responding to treatment? What do you think about? Yeah, so there's a few things. One is the symptoms. How are they going with pain, stiffness, um, swelling, and, and in particular, you know, the, the stiffness, this morning predominant sort of symptoms? Because again, a lot of people will have um, osteoarthritis as well, and those symptoms are different. So it's important to continue to tease out, you know, if somebody has ongoing pain. Um, and they're on treatment for rheumatoid, is it because the rheumatoid is still not really well controlled or is it something else? Um, and then also, you know, in, in terms of their blood tests, if their inflammatory markers had been elevated in the past and now they're on treatment, then I'd be checking those. And I do that regularly anyway with, you know, checking their bone marrow function and their liver function and kidney function um, when they're on treatment, because a lot of those treatments can um, affect those parameters. Um, and also, um, function like how are they going so they might be feeling better but they're still struggling with certain things you know like um fine motor movements making a fist and and all that kind of stuff so that that's also still in, important for me to keep monitoring um as well yeah and so this comes to the concept of what rheumatologists talk about what is remission uh remission uh is a term you may hear your rheumatologist mention um, they may that they often thinking about it in their head. They may not use that term for you, but um, I, I always try to explain it in simple terms that um, we aim to get nearly everyone into remission. Certainly, people we we treat early on, and remission doesn't mean absence of symptoms or complete absence of symptoms. Uh, and I think that's important to understand because to treat someone so much that they have no symptoms, uh, you often end up giving way too much medication. Often having very manageable symptoms, low-grade symptoms, not too many um, flares. Uh, when someone comes and sees me, I don't like to see any swelling in their joints. So you'll often uh, see your rheumatologist feeling their feeling joints, and you're probably wondering what they're doing every visit. But we're feeling for swelling in joints. And uh, thirdly, we like to see those um, blood markers, those inflammation markers, uh, normal or at least very, very close to normal. Um, and, and then we know that within the body, the inflammation is settled. And we know that if we get that inflammation settled in the body, body all those other very nasty things that we talk about, the heart attack risk and the you know, cancer risk, that drops. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons why you, you're asked to do a blood test, uh, usually before your visit to your rheumatologist. Yeah, so disease remission, someone who's doing well with rheumatoid doesn't mean they have no pain. Um, it just means very manageable, very low grade, and uh, hopefully hardly any pain. So uh, Pauline, can we prevent disability with our treatments? Yeah, that's the aim. And that's the aim of starting treatment as soon as possible so that we don't have um, essentially that's that cycle, that journey whereby you have ongoing chronic inflammation that gradually over time causes damage in the joint and those da that damage you can't undo, unfortunately. So the, the, the aim of treatment is to get that inflammation down as much as possible so that there's no irritation to the joint and there's no erosions and, and gradually there's no um, deformities because you know the tendons and ligaments start to get affected and, and all of that instability. And, and that's then obviously going to have an impact on people's quality of life and their ability to work and function and look after loved ones or just have 
you know, a normal life, a, a normal quality of life. Um, so that is essentially the aim with these medications. Sometimes it might take a bit of time to get there. Yes. How people respond and how, and whether people also have side effects to medications, because there's no point in pushing on with something with the aim of treating the inflammation if they feel crook as a result of that. Yeah. And so the final um, point here about what is treat to target. Now that's a, uh, that's sort of a medical term that rheumatologists think of, but you may have seen it written somewhere. So I thought I'd uh, touch on it. Um, and that's really one of the more sort of modern concepts over the last decade, really, that rheumatologists aim to is that we, we have a target in our head, which is often remission. Uh, and if you're at each visit, if you're not at your target, ideally something changes to get you towards that target. Um, so you're treating towards that. Um, so it, it's, it, it ends up with more medication early on, because as I said, we know that the earlier you get things settled, the far better your long-term outcome is. And so uh, treating to that target may mean more frequent visits at the beginning, more blood tests, more medications, with the idea that get you into remission and then have the least amount of medications to maintain you in remission. Uh, and so uh, though it may feel more intensive at the beginning and that's uh, deliberate in a sense um, because that gives the best long-term outcomes. Um, for the future. So that was part one of our educational event all about treating rheumatoid arthritis as early as possible. If you'd like to continue watching the presentation then it's available on BJC Connect. You can create an account for free and continue watching not only this presentation but a whole range of other presentations and resources that we've collated that we hope will help you. Um, but thanks for tuning in and hopefully see you soon.